Hey, this is Kendall with Black Govis, and I'm here with my good friend Jared. Uh, Jared is runs a business called JRS Processing. Um, I've done a couple of my own animals, but I just can't do them as good as you, Jared. <laughs> so uh, we're actually in your in your garage. Um, this is the nicest garage that I've probably ever seen. Yours and doesn't look like this? No, no. Uh, Bridger's been into my garage. <laughs> but uh, we're here today. We've got Bridger uh, that is behind the camera. He was behind the gun yesterday and got this cow elk. And, and we'd usually obviously break it down in the field. But we're going to go over today. Uh, we're going to break down this elk. We've, we pulled it out skin on so that we can show a couple of things of, of tips from, from you, Jared. On, on what you would suggest as a meat processor, also as a hunter, uh, both for meat preservation, um, cleanliness. Uh, we're gonna give a lot of tips and, and, and pieces that he's, that, that he's learned over the years. You've been processing meat how long, Jared? About 35 years. 35 years, yeah. good heavens. You've seen a few things. Yeah, really, and, and, it, and it'll be a great opportunity to just show a few things, because I, I see a lot, of, a lot of meat left in the field. Mm. Or, or product that comes, you know, animals that come in that are dirty and, and that affects the yield of what you get back. So, you know, ultimately you want a, a, a nice clean piece of meat when you're done. So we'll just kind of go through the process. If you, if you don't have a good processor and, and you're looking for one, you should find one. If, you know, if you want to do it on your own, we're still going to have plenty of inf insight in here, especially for that, um, both as far as deboning and when you should or shouldn't. And then uh, obviously take, you know, taking down the animal, this elk right here. And then, you know, like, like Jared was saying, some tips and tricks that will help really main, I mean, you've worked hard for this animal. You've worked hard for the meat. You want to maximize the most amount of meat that you can get and put in that freezer, freezer so you can get it in, uh, in the stomach. Okay, Jared, this is, uh, this is the normal scenario. Well, not normal in the garage, but scenario where you've got the animal gutted. Whether you're going to gut or not, that's, that's really more your style. What are some just some basics that, that you see on the meat that's brought in that you could tell guys as far as you know what to do when you get to the animal and you're ready to get started on the, on the job? Yep, obviously, once that animal hits the ground, that's when the work begins. Sure. So it's, it's all about being prepared. If you go out in the field and you know you're prepared to, after you harvest an animal, to prepare it and get it out, you know, having that game bag ready, um, depending on where you're at, obviously... Bridger was fortunate to get this elk out whole. Yeah. He had a little bit of snow on the ground, and, and he was able to get it out whole, which typically doesn't happen right. on, on an elk. Right. So, um, you know, typically you're going you're gonna to end up quartering this thing out, um, and it's all about, you know, taking the time, keeping it clean, you know, being prepared, having your game bags. You know, once you take that skin off, you know, I just lay that skin back yep. and use that as a tarp, and then you can get to this whole side of the animal taking the quarters off and we'll show some examples of that. Um, and then once that quarter comes off, what do you do with it? You know, have your game bag ready, maybe some paracord to, to tie that in a tree as you finish the rest of the animal. There's been a lot of times that I've, I've just jumped in and taking care of my deer or elk. And then I, once I get the quarter off, it's like, oh man, is there a log around here? And, and, and you know, the, just preparing, I guess the table, if you will, um, you know, if, the, if you don't have a ground cloth or you haven't brought a piece of uh, like a sheet, I often carry a sheet of plastic, just a real lightweight plastic, or you can use Tyvek, um, anything that you can re either reuse or just is disposable. And then I'll clean out the area, taking, you know, just kind of as much, just making sure the area is clean. And then I usually locate like a rock or a couple logs. I'll put two logs that are parallel. Um, that I can, I can kind of set those quarters on, um, you know, and the, I'll lay the game bags on there, put it on the on that, you know, weather conditions permitting. So that, yeah, just really good tips. Appreciate yeah. the insight of that. So, yeah, since we've got this whole animal here, we're gonna we're gonna skin this um, uh, pretty pretty quick, and then. Uh, but I saw you take off this knee. I, I've never seen a knee come off that fast. So. <laughs> Well, and I tell you one thing I like as a processor, I like to have that hawk right there to hang it by. Uh huh. And so you that know, you know, not cutting that tendon right. off. So you know, if somebody brings one to me, I just soon have that leg on, and then I'll cut the hawk, you know, cut it off. So I have that hawk to hang it on. Uh, just makes it makes it much easier to hang. So, okay. You know, depending on where you're at, if you're going to haul that thing out five miles and you're going to bone it out, which we're going to talk about that, then obviously that changes things up. Okay. But, uh, this elk we had overnight. In the back of my truck, it got down to 11 degrees. Whoa! Yeah. 
What's, what's a, what are the temperatures that you can keep an elk at or a deer and, and know, okay, the, the meat's going to be fine? Like, let's, let's talk about overnight temperatures. A lot of guys will shoot an animal. I've shot plenty of animals that, you know, kind of last light, a couple I've let stay overnight. Others I've just gone in and looked for them. What's, uh, what's that, that temperature and or the condition the elk's in? Well, when you think about meat, uh, holding meat under 40 degrees is ideal. Okay. However, you know, when you take an animal like this, I mean, it has, has this, I mean, that hide can be up to half an inch thick. Oh, yeah, there. especially up in the and neck. It, and yeah. it'll just keep that, retain that heat in there for overnight. So even though it's cold, you know, you have to think about, okay, maybe I'll come back tomorrow, but you need to break that up, you know, open that up and maybe break those quarters off. You know, and especially I see it right in here on that hind quarter. It's such a, a mass of meat back there. It just doesn't cool off. So, you know, if you're in that situation, it's best to, you know, open them up, uh, open that, maybe go down to the ball socket there and open that uh, hind up so it can cool off. What, what are recognizable traits that you see the meat? Is it, are we talking discoloration? Oh, absolutely. Well, obviously smell. <laughs> yeah, um, a little, little bit of both. I mean, I, I call it kind of a radioactive green. You know, you can start to see it and that's where you'll see it right around that ball socket. As soon as you start taking that quarter off, you can see that tinge of green coming in there. So, so again, it really, when this thing hits the ground, you've got to have a plan to get that out to make sure it's wholesome. You know, once that temperature goes too high, there's no, you know, just bringing it back down to temperature isn't going to make that wholesome again. When you watch like some of the, some of the hunting videos that are out there and you see guys saying, you know, they made a questionable shot. They're not sure. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we'll just come back tomorrow. Like you as a processor, are you going, <laughs> don't do it. Like go yeah. find that animal. Absolutely. Or, and as a hunter, I'm like, oh, that would, uh, it would be a sleepless night for me for sure. You know, because I'm thinking about temperature. The, the, the neatest quote I heard was from a, a, a lose letter out of Wyoming from a game warden talking about antelope hunting. And he says, uh, you know, would you go to the store, buy your T-bone steaks, throw them on top of your car, tie them down and drive on a couple hundred miles of dirt roads and expect them to be good? You know, so, <laughs> you know, I love that quote. Um, but yeah, you've got to, you've got to have a plan to get that taken care of and get that meat cooled down. Gotcha. Cool. Well, let's keep going on this, uh, this gal. Okay. In this, uh, environment, I'll take this hawk up and we'll raise it up and start working on it. Okay. And obviously having a sharp knife makes a difference. There's a lot of different options when it comes to that too, as you know, but. What kind of knife, uh, do you have a particular brand or style that you like in the field? Uh, just as a, a I mean, your whole, your whole uh, life has been with a knife in your hand. Yeah, there's times I have to say, all right, Jared, I don't need four knives when I go out, because I like knives, of course. But, you know, I like uh, the removable blade style, you know, like the outdoor edge, you know, you can just yep. remove those blades. But I still carry a little knife sharpener just to steal that, you know, unscrews and you can just zip it like that yep. and, and it brings that edge back just so quick. And this, I'm not saying by any means that what I'm doing here is the only way to do it. So this is just one method of many. Is, is what's your opinion on, on water on the meat? Because uh, once in a while, you know, you, something happens, you've got dust and dirt and twigs and all sorts of garbage on the meat. Uh, or let's say you make a bad shot and you gut shot it. Tell me about water. Why, a, why would you put water? Why would you take the time to rinse it off? Why wouldn't you? What, yeah. What's your, what's your... Great, great question. And, and the, a simple answer is water harbors bacteria. Harbors bacteria. Harbors bacteria. So it's good to keep it clean. Um, obviously, when you're archery hunting, you know, you've got a cooler full of ice. And I just suggest to have that, you know, let the water drain out. Maybe, and I always take like a plastic bag to put it on, on top of the top ice, of the ice okay. and then let that ice drain the water out of the cooler. Is there value to having ice around the meat or, or in that sense, do you, would you put the meat inside a plastic bag so it's not going to get wet? Well, and that's really a, 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 a touchy subject. Double-edged sword. It is because if you put that in a bag and you seal that up, it's like an, uh, like an oven yeah. essentially if that meat hasn't been totally cooled off. So, and I'll do that when I go on an early season Wyoming antelope hunt. You know, I'll, I'll quarter that out, but I'll have blocks of ice prepared. I put them on the bottom of the cooler, and then I put, I actually put my meat in a bag, but I leave it open. So, oh, okay. So then the, the meat's not going to contact the ice and the water, and yet it can air out. 
Gotcha. So that, if you've seen, if a guy's brought in some meat that's been uh, been contact with water for an extended period of time, like let's say a hind quarter, how much of that meat do you end up like losing as what? a result of that, or do you really lose that much? Yeah, I mean, it, it'll really discolor it. It takes the coloration out of it. You know, it turns it like a you know just a, a light color. I trim that exterior off to where you're you're down to some good wholesome meat. Okay. The whenever I have uh, somebody bring something in and it's in black garbage bags, Emma, I, it makes me a little nervous. You know, was that cooled off? Because I've had guys bring in meat where they put, you know, they've quartered an elk, they put it in a bag, they tied that bag off, and then they brought it to me. Ooh. And as soon as you open the cooler, you hit that, whew, you can smell it. And it, it was, unfortunately, it was spoiled, you know, an entire elk. So you've got to get it cooled off, and that's what's nice and, and about And they sometimes like, well, I, I took care of it. Like, what? what? Yeah. They just learned a valuable lesson. And next year, they, they use game bags. Yeah, and, and like our Black Ovis yeah, bags. Yeah, we're going to talk about some game bags and the value of, of a game bag, too, yeah. versus a plastic bag. Tell me about this zone right here. We're in this this area between kind of back of rib cage, hind quarter. There's a lot of times, like you know, if I'm cut, if I'm taking this in the field, I'm cutting straight through here. Yep. Um, how much of this is really usable meat on the tail end of this uh, this the the rib cage before you really get into the the hind quarter itself? Uh, there's that transitionary period yeah. is what is what I'm skinning right here, and, and, that, and that's I where nick that. Yep. Yep. That's where your flank is, and there is some good meat there. Um, <clears throat> I typically tell folks that the difference between one coming in whole and being processed versus one being quartered in the field, just a quick you know, gutless method where they leave, you know, some meat on the rib cage, maybe the brisket, stuff like that. Yep. Just gets left on the carcass. Probably about 30 pounds of burger. That much, yeah. really? Wow. Yeah, I'd say you get a good 30 pounds. If you're debone, if you're doing, let's say you're doing gutless out in the field, are you still pulling out all that rib meat, uh, you personally? Well, the way I pull it off that rib and cut it, it pulls, it just leaves a real thin membrane in there. Uh -huh. So I don't go in between the ribs because you can see, you know, maybe there was some, uh, like you said, if it nicked a, uh, an intestine or something, you know, it could be contaminated in there a little bit. And so I don't pull it in between the ribs. I know some areas you require. Yeah, like to. Alaska, Alaska, when I was hunting up there, yeah. you have to. You have to. And, and like, you know, our, I was with a guide, it was a, it was a goat hunt, and we, he took pictures of it oh. in case the game warden oh, did idea. inspect and say, hey, we want to know. Because he has sort of, of game wardens going out to the location to verify. Yeah. And then they actually count the rib meat. Maybe if they've, uh, maybe if they've got a slow day or something, <laughs> or they just want to go see some good country. Yeah, and we'll kind of show how I do that. And like I said, this one's a little bit frozen, but it'll still give you a good idea. And it, it'll pull, you know, ninety percent of that meat off, hmm. and they'll leave just that thin membrane on the carcass. Super interesting. Speaking of which, how much how much meat? You hear that all the time. I mean, I've you know people ask, and I have a lot of non-hunting friends that will ask how much meat. Do you get off a particular animal? What, what's your uh, best case and normal scenario for elk and deer? What, what? Well, how many pounds? I think on an elk, you know, if you bring it in whole, and and I weigh it by the carcass, and that's typically how most processors will do that, and you get about, depending on shot placement, of course, too. You know, oh, that, can, that, that too. Can play, that can play a huge factor into the yield on the meat, but you know, on a whole carcass, I'd I'd rough say you know, 60, 65% yield of boneless meat from the carcass. From the carcass? Yeah. Okay. So probably 180 pounds of meat. Okay. Yeah. And then a mule there, if, uh, if a guy shoots in, you know, your average 150, 160 buck, yeah. four, four point. <clears throat> and that's where it gets a little deceptive. Somebody brings a big deer and they worked hard and they, you know, either drug that out or they packed it out. I mean, I packed a four point out this last uh, deer season and I weighed my pack when I got home. Your own? Yeah, yeah. My, my own deer, Jack, my son and I went out and shot that deer, and I think my pack weighed 85 pounds. So, and there was no way I was going to drag that deer out whole up this hill. So, so I quartered it, used the black Ovis pack, uh, bags, yep. which was ideal, and that pack was 85 pounds. Huh. And that's still with the uh, bone in the quarters. So hey. once I cut that up, I didn't weigh it, but I was, it was probably, you know, 50 pounds of meat 55 pounds of meat hmm. interesting yeah and and when you're talking about exit holes i mean that's a whole another subject is uh there's been times you know a whole elk will come in like this and it looks 
Which is great, but then once you start skinning it, you know, that tells the, tells the story of where that animal's been hit. You know, so it, shot placement is, is critical. And, you know, if that animal's been hit in the hind quarter and, and you blow a femur through the hind quarters, you know, that's gonna, you're going to take a toll on your yield. When I'm doing when I'm doing an animal and it's on its side in the field like this, you know, all things considered, I usually go past the backbone just a smidge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm thinking ahead or I, but do you usually go right to the backbone or do you, you go past? No, I'm, I'm the same way, Kendall. I go I go past it. You know, if I can get a couple inches past it, so then I know when I roll that over, I've, I've debo you know, taken all the every, all the meat off there and I yep. roll it over. How uh, how far up that neck do you go? I go right up the back of the head. Right to the back of the head. Yep. Really. There's not a lot of meat on there, but I'm a meat guy. I gotta, you know, <laughs> I gotta take it all off. So one thing I really want to point out is if you look at this carcass, yep. You see how much hair is not there? There's none. There's no hair there. You know, we kind of rolled that hide up. That's exactly what you'd have. That hide's out of the way. The hair's out of the way. It's uh, it's no hair, and that's where. You know, having your game bags ready to go, and, and what are you going to do with it once you take that quarter off the carcass? Where's it going to go? You know, th this is going to be on your dinner table. So <laughs> they just think to... you're going to do some magic, and then all yeah. of a sudden, yeah. You know, I've dug out broadheads. Uh, you know, all kinds of Bits bullets. Of arrows in there. Yeah, Avalon blades. Avalon blades. We, we talked about that. Bullets so, of all sizes yeah. and shapes. I mean, there thing? are some big. That's a huge one right there. Oh yeah. 50 caliber muzzle loader bullet. There's another one right there, mushroomed out, real nice. Let's 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 pretend that this isn't in the rib, which is that's pretty darn ideal, quite frankly. Uh, maybe just touching up against the uh, the back strap. How much of that extra area should I cut out in the field if this is my animal? Well, I'd take it anywhere that it has the bloodshot in it. You know, so if that was into the into that back strap a little bit, half let's say half an inch wider than than that yeah. bloodshot area. Yeah, okay. be safe. I mean, you want to be safe and. Okay. Yeah. Tips of the trade right one, here. One thing I do to avoid the hair, I mean, nobody wants to open up a package of meat, prepare it for dinner and have a hair in there. So Of course. So as a processor, we really work hard to make sure that there's no hair in the meat. And I'm, I'm sure there's been times it's, it's, uh, it's happened. But between when we cut it, when we wrap it, you know, that last person seeing that meat, we really work hard on it. So little trick of the trade is a little torch. And so if I'm hanging that up and, you know, maybe I got a little little hair on it from where I cut that, you know, I can just real quick, I'm not cooking the meat. I'm just cut any of that dry hair there and boom, it's off. Cause I, you know, when I've done, the few times I've done my own, it, it's, it's dang near impossible to yeah. get that, all that hair off. Like it's picking hard. it, it's just. And for me as, as taking all the animals in as a processor, now when, like when I shot that buck, I told my son, I'm like, okay, this is going to be clean. And, <laughs> and, and it was lucky if we had a couple of hairs on it when we got it in here, you know, because we took our, took our time. And it didn't take that much time either. You know, I mean, we had a storm rolling in. It was, you know, there was snow and there was another storm rolling in. And it really didn't take that much time because, you know, you and I had been talking. I had the Black Ovis game bags. Yeah. Which are amazing. You know, the difference between... Had you used those before we met? I had not. However, I see many of my clients come in with them. So they, there's the difference between a, you know, a Walmart cheesecloth game bag yep. and a Black Ovis, you know, quality game bag. Yeah, you pay a little bit more money for them, but ultimately, you know, it's the difference, you know, end results of yeah. what, you, what you take home. The, the cheaper ones, you know, they, some guys will put them in a bag and then they lay them in the ground. Well, all that dirt just goes right up through them game bags and gets mm -hmm. right on the meat. And the Black Ovis style bags keep it nice and clean and allows it to breathe and drain. Okay. Which is important too. Draining and, you know, big deal, of course. You want to get, yeah. get as much of that blood that comes out, you want to get it away yep. from the meat. Yep. Let it drain. And it keeps, you know, if it's warmer, it keeps the insects out. And, yep. But it's always nice if you can hang it a little bit and let that, uh, you know, let it drain, cool off a little bit. Jared, we're, we've, got the, we've got the elk skin. This is kind of our part two, if you will, of, of how do you suggest, and it's not rocket science, but there are some, some unique things to keep in mind as far as we're going to take the hind quarter off first we're going to take the front quarter off first and then we're going to pull out that back strap and then go into some of the neck meat or do you do the neck meat after you you do it one side and then on the other side no i do everything on this side before i roll it over okay perfect so that way it's you're not rolling it over possibly getting it dirty and it doesn't matter whether you take a, a front shoulder hind quarter off either one you know 
I'll start with the hind quarter here. Okay. That's a big, the biggest portion of it. Uh, and then we'll take that front shoulder off, dig into the back straps, and then we'll show you how I take that, that meat off, even though this one's a little bit solid. Cold. Yeah. So. Okay, so let's start in on, uh, on what, uh, and if you'll just talk through kind of like things you're thinking about as you're in the field hunting and you're taking this, uh, this quarter off this, this elk. Yep. Like I said, a lot of this, I just use that for grind. That's getting into part of the flank, so I just kind of cut that right down. And, and really, it's just like uh, everything's got a seam on it, and, and you can just kind of follow those seams down. Okay. So, and, you know, we'll probably talk more about how much to go. I mean, you know, do I take that muscle off? You know, there's a seam, I start cutting, and, and then you end up handling it more than is necessary mm -hmm. in the field. Okay, so... Here, your tenderloins run right up into that hind quarter there, so you want to be a little bit careful. So this tenderloin comes right here. Yeah. Um, I, I, sometimes I wonder if I'm cutting part of the tenderloin away or how far back into the hind quarter I need to go. Yeah. Where, where's that kind of fine line well, between? Because that, that tenderloin, is, is it, like any muscle, has an insertion and a, and a connection point, and this, yeah. this comes out and connects down into that hip. Yeah. Where, where do you t like to well, cut that? Well, typically, once, like you said, one, this, this one's already been removed from that pelvis a little bit, so, you know, it comes down just like it has How'd Bridger do? Did, did not, he do all right on bad, that? Not bad, not bad. I mean, that's a little frozen, but good job, Bridger. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and then you can just kind of just follow the bone and let the weight of that leg uh, fall down. This is another point where I, you probably see guys that will go too far back instead of yeah. curling around yep. that, that socket, correct? All, a, lot, a lot of guys do that. So, and then I, you can just cut that right there. You've got to cut that tenderloin, you know, and it just kind of comes in right there. So you can just cut right there, and you can see that muscle just let loose. And you see. So now that separates the tenderloin. I see, yep. From You've the got the tenderloin. Yep. I don't want to get my hand in there too much, but <laughs> I, only, I, have, I can see that there. Guys. And then... You just want to be careful not to stick that knife too far down in there and just follow that bone. Why? Uh, you're going to go right into the meat because that knife's just dirty, gets contaminated. You can see every knife cut, you know, whether it be from somebody skinning, which think about your knife running through that dirty hide, and you can see every knife cut just by the contamination. That Do you has. switch in, in the field? Are you switching out between the knife you skin with and the knife you cut into the animal with, or just you're, you're, you're using the same knife, but you're cleaning it off? Have, Before I, you really start into this, and I problem. usually have two. I have a fixed blade knife. If I'm going to bone something like that, I'll use it rather than uh, my Havilon uh, or something. Havilon yeah, I I, I carry Havilon. both. I usually have yeah. the Havilon or the goat knife, and then I'm you know I have a, a couple different bench maids that I really like or yeah. Argali Just, makes it's a, a small, really nice life, uh, knife. Drop point blade. Yep. But yep. It, it's, it makes a great skinner or uh, break uh, breakdown like this. Yeah. Okay. So you can see here, there's another little little bone right there that comes off that pelvis. And that's another point that I know I personally have left meat. Yep, right there. So you just kind of follow that down. Oh yeah, there's that. It goes all, all the way up there. Yep. And then uh, now, right. if we were in the field, I'd be holding this leg for yeah. you. <clears throat> I'll pull this off just a little bit. And so I just let that, you know, you just the weight of that that quarter, just like that. There she goes. So this is the piece right here that a lot of times gets left in the in the field. That you know? piece right at the bottom. Yeah. Yep. So if you were in the field, that's where you'd you know take a piece of paracord or something, or like you mentioned, a log and something nice and clean to set it on. It's nice if you can hang it and just let that thing start airing out. So there's two ways that, you know, sometimes guys will have, you know, a lot more meat on the front shoulder. I usually don't. I just take it up against the front shoulder because I'm going to pull that off. You're going to pull this this flank off. Yeah. All that brisket and that I've off. I've always wondered, yeah, it's like how much do you want me to leave on the, the shoulder itself and how much can I just isolate and take off? I suppose because there's a lot of guys that won't take this meat right yeah. here. Look at that. That's a big chunk of meat there. Yeah, especially on an elk. So, yeah, like I said, there's no exact science of how to do this. So, you know, some people may, may critique the way that we're doing it, and, yep. that's, and that's fine. Um, this is just the way I personally do it hold when I'm in the field. So there's a couple of ways. You know, when I, when I process the shoulder, you know, that's what I start with, but I'll also have a tub of trim and, and meat to, to deal with too. So I just ride up along the back side of the scapula there. Like that. Okay. 
So here you're going to pull off this 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 I'm rear gonna, hind flank. I'm going to pull off that flank a little bit there. So I'm just going to cut that down, and you can see that back strap. You're right at the kind of the line right, between the right back on. strap. Yep. You, and, you can okay. see the back strap right there. Yep. And then in this case, I mean, I'm just going to do it kind of like I do it in my shop. I'm just going to take that flank out. Right along that that the bone. Uh, that bone. And then all that's going to be just trimmed out, cleaned up, and delicious sausage made. So that tenderloin, yeah, you're just you're cutting up the backbone. Yep. And then really just follow the bones. That's a little bit frozen in there too. There's your tenderloin. Heck of a tenderloin. So right here, when you start into <clears throat> the when you start into the back strap, um, again we've got some curves right here yep. on that pelvis. What what are you yeah. what, what are you looking for? So so I do it from from this angle with your knife instead of like this because it does it kind of curves up oh, in you're, there. Oh, you're positioning your knife here. Yeah. I think a lot of times guys just go, go straight down right yeah. here instead of coming and but you're saying bring that almost the point of your knife back towards the kind of the the yep. rump if you will. Yep, yep, cuz this bone comes out here and then it kind of cuts in there where the meat goes in there and there's not a lot, but you know, it's just it is a, it is a back strap, so so you just follow that down there. You can just take your knife and run it all the way along that back back bone all the way up to the neck. Okay. And then we'll take that back strap out. If you're in the field, are you going down the back the top of the back strap first, or do you go down the uh, the top of the ribs that that where that line is right there? Um, do you start front back? Do you have a do you have a way of doing that, or is it just you just go after it? All all depends on how that animal's where, laying. Like this one, laying. that 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 uh, backbone's down a ways right there. Yep. And so it can be either way. You know, you can you can come down like that. Like I said, if you're you're gonna take just that back strap, and we'll take a little bit of that uh, blood shot out. You know, you just take that back strap right there, and then we'll just take that down that way and, and show them how to do it that way. Okay. Okay. If you can start right there with that bone, the rib. Keeping, again, a, you know, trying to keep as much meat on that back. Are you strap. thinking about your blade angle as well, kind of oh, yeah. being against that rib versus cutting back into yep. the back strap here? Absolutely. And then, and then right here, that rib changes a little bit. That angle, you know, kind of goes in a little bit. It so, rounds more right. than, than it, right back here. It's flatter. So if you've got too much knife blade in there, you're going to be into the back strap. And I, and I actually do see that all the time. And once we get up into here, now you're getting up into the chuck and then a little bit further up in there with the neck. But when I do mine, I just take it all the way down here as oh. one big piece, you know, instead of just trying to take that piece out there. See, I, I'm guilty as charged. I oftentimes would just pick a point and I always wonder how far up into that neck do I, should I yeah. go or not go? But uh, what would you prefer as a processor to see? You know, it's, it's fine uh, to do it either way. But this way, you're going to get the full benefit of that back strap. That back strap really runs, you know, from that pelvis. pelvis all the way up into here, which is, you know, your loin up into your rib. This is the separation right here. The, yeah. this, this is the back strap, this upper portion. This stuff here is... Yep. This is a, is a really good muscle. It's called the spinellus, and it's a very tender muscle. I typically take it out because there's such a heavy ligament in between it. Yeah. So I take that out and clean up that ligament to where you just have the back strap. Okay. But, but when I'm in the field, you know, it's still one piece of meat instead of dealing with multiple pieces of meat. And so now we're at that point where, you know, you're up here uh, with the backbone, and now you're just kind of going the other way instead of had I had the right angle, I would have went along the backbone yep. and then come like this, and then it's separated. But in this case, we'll just go just follow backwards. I mean, that, so look at that. that's a gorgeous long you know, piece then, of meat. And then when we cut that, you know, we'll clean all this up. We'll take that silver tissue off. You know, all of this just goes into burger. But on the back side, see, we didn't get in any of the back strap. And so you've got it's a gorgeous. Nice, nice clean back strap with no, you know, no knife nicks in it, nice and clean. And then at that point, that's where I would, you know, we'll, we'll take this off. We'll just kind of like carve that out that we're not going to mess with that. And then, uh, We'll just take that meat off and we'll just use that for some... All this stuff here? Yep. Okay. Some delicious maple bacon sausage. Like we had this morning. Yeah. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to we're going to break down this front quarter from the elk that Bridger shot yesterday. We've got the hind quarter right here. And so we want to show you each, just the, the, the do's and don'ts about when you do this. But before we dive into that, Jared, talk to me a little bit about your philosophy as a, both as a hunter as well as a meat processor 
why you would debone, why you would leave the meat on the bone, um, and then also from a meat quantity standpoint, um, what's, uh, what are some of your thoughts there? Sure. Well, and that's, uh, that's a big question. So obviously weight, especially when you're talking on an elk, you know, that, that leg bone, especially on that hind quarter, you yep. know, it can be, you know, eight to 10 pounds, depending on the size of the elk. So depending on how far you're in there, you sure. know, that, that makes a big difference. You know, from a processor's perspective, I look at it as the less that hind quarter, less that animal's handled, the better yield you're going to get from, for, as a customer. Um, you know, because it's the potential to be in dirty, um, you know, more pieces, mm -hmm. more dirty, more contamination. So I encourage folks, if they are going to bone it out, just take the bone out and then leave that meat intact. You know, Don't well start into the yeah. butchering process, yeah, leave, if you will. Leave that, leave that until you get home, even if you're going to do it yourself, you know, which is fine. It's, you're going to have better yields and better, uh, cleaner product once you, get, once you get that home. Then you can break it down. When you, when you debone, and, and you'll show us this primarily on the, on the hind quarter, and you're then putting it into the bag, uh, this is one, one thought that I've had as I've done it, would you turn it inside out or basically keep it the same structure as if the bone was in and have it, um, you know, just the bones out and it's yeah, kind of well, same thing? I definitely keep it the same structure it is because then I, I've less... turned, I know I've turned it inside out a couple of times. And, that, and that's okay to cool I'm it. I'm trying to cool it, yeah. but I don't, I don't know if really that's a good thing or not, yeah. not a good thing to do. And I, and I know the way you brought it in, you, you use some good quality game bags. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, we've already talked about that, but that's key is using those good quality game bags because it keeps the meat clean and yep, still absolutely. allows it to cool and, and, and breathe. Okay. So that's important. So it's important uh, on a big piece of meat like that hind quarter, you know, to, to depend on the temperature outside, yep. you know, you want to get it cooled down, um, but it's just all about uh, keeping it clean. What's the, what's the, for you, I'm talking, if you're out hunting, what's that distance that you'll say, listen, I know this is going to suck. This is going to be hard, but I'm going to keep the bone in because I'm only X amount of miles out or it's it, because you know, you're already thinking about the meat. Yeah. I'm going to get more meat. It's going to be better. It's going to be easier to butcher. Um, again, whether, whether it's like me and I'm dropping off to you or whether it's me and I'm doing it by myself, if you're going to be out hunting, what, what is that? Do you have a magic number yeah. that you think well, about? Well, you know, I'm getting old. So, <laughs> you know, and, and the way your son's that, pretty strong. I've seen him. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have him along, but you know, when I think about how that is in a pack, and, and you deal with packs a lot more than I do, yeah. um, I like that bone in so that it holds that meat instead of just all just plop down to the bottom yeah. of that pack, you know, you know, pushing right on the bottom of my back. That's one reason I like that that up. I mean, I cut the, the hoof off, you know, the leg. Yeah, of course, so which I always off. scratch my head when I see you guys Packing that thing Packing out, out the, the, the legs. hoofs. I'm like, what on earth are you doing? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of weight there. Yeah, totally. So, yep, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. So, yeah, you, but so the, in this scenario, uh, watch as we go through this breakdown, and Jared's going to uh, give his kind of tips and tricks and point out the different meat cuts. Whether you've seen this before, this is kind of just Jared's take and, and how he would debone. And so let's jump into uh, to this front quarter, and then we'll go through the hind quarter. If I'm out in the field and I'm 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 a pro, I've got the quarter off the animal. I've usually spread it out. I carry a piece of plastic or a little tarp. Uh, what's my where where do I start in this this front quarter? Yeah, one, once that front shoulder's off, and that, and that's a real important point, Kendall, is to make sure you've got a clean surface to work on. If you're doing this in the dirt and you're getting this all dirty, and you get it home, you're gonna have a heck of a time getting it cleaned up. It doesn't just brush off. Yeah. You know, so it's real important. That's a good tip is to have a little piece of plastic or a little tarp. Do you start on this side, like this top side, or do you start on the other side if I you do. were? Well, as, as we did that carcass, we pulled a lot of that meat off, you know, so it just got down to the shoulder. So all that chuck meat, rib meat, that stayed on the carcass. We pulled that off separate and talked about that going into the burger and, and sausage. So pretty clean here. So... And again, depending on how much you want to, uh, you know, to take off. For me, just I just separate it, you know, like I would if I'm going to totally debone that. Yep. You know, I just, I, you know, you got to. And remember, that. we're deboning not for the sake of processing, but simply to break it down and get right. out of the mountain. And that's where you get that scapula right there. So there's a bone, bone right there. That bone that runs vertically. Right. Or... So you take that, and this is, uh, you know, this muscle here. They call it a, a mock or a chuck tender. Um, because it's not really that tender. Now this is one of my favorite pieces of meat right here is a flat iron steak. 
Yeah, that's one of, to me, that's, uh, and it's, it's touted as one of the, the second most tender muscle in an animal next to the tenderloin. So, and then it's just a matter of falling the bone. You know, you don't want to leave a ton of meat on there. I know it's not, you know, like having it on the block, which we're fortunate to have here, yeah. you know, doing this out in the field. But you can still remove that muscle and just, you know, it's just all about, like we talked about, the angle of that blade, you know, not being into the meat, but being pointing down towards the bone. And I see it on this, 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 uh, what do you call this, a hawk? Mock. The mock. Mock, mock tender. Mock tender. You're, you're not going to cut it off. You're going to, you're going to let, allow this to still kind of be attached to other things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, take the bone out. The front shoulder is a little bit more difficult, you know, because you've got the scapula, you've got the bone here. There's really three main muscles this on here. This kneecap, if you will, yeah, is that's, just. Yeah, that's huge. You know, I mean, that's that big bone there. So, and you might have a tendency but again, the less you touch it, the less you, less cuts, the less muscles. Just try to keep it all together and get that weight of that bone out of there, or the size, you know, so you can fit it in your pack, you know. So you can see that scapula just yep. comes right along there, and then that another another little ridge right there yep. on that far side of that uh, yep. flat see iron. See that edge, and like I said, that's uh, again, that's one of my favorite cuts of meat there. So good job not shooting the flat iron, Bridger. And then I just kind of lift it up, put my knife around there, and you heard that little bit of a, that was that ball socket coming apart right there. Well, that's kind of cool. See, you're cutting that, that scapula clean out. Yeah. And there's actually some good, good lean meat on the bottom side of that scapula, too. There's not so. a lot of it, but, but nope. you're seeing that's really good cut on that bottom, or just really good meat. Uh, on the bottom, I just use that for trim, for a grind. So... So this oh, one, now that. you've come around the knee bone, or that, that, that big knee, knee socket. Uh, flip it over, and, and really it's just, uh, like I said, like connect the dots only in reverse, and there's a bone that runs there, and a bone that runs there. You, know, you, can, you can see that bone. So we're just going to take that meat off that bone. It gets a little scrappy there, but like I said, if somebody brought this in to be processed, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind that because I know how it come off the bone, and you've still got the main muscles intact. They haven't... Uh, pull these out, these aren't cut into portions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, and then when we, you know, when I seam that out at the shop, it's gonna be nice and clean. Or again, when you're doing this at home, you know, you can use that trim for, for grind and stuff like that. So then it's just a matter of just running the knife in. I'm not digging that knife all the way in. I've just got the tip of that knife right along that bone there. And I'm just gonna follow that bone all the way up there. And then for this, purpose, we're just going to come down the bone the other way. I guess one, sometimes, you know, my when I'm in the field, I'm questioning what should go to what side of the bone and what should go to the other side of the bone, and, and you're just going, you're following this, this straight line down the yeah. top of it. Yeah. Okay. And just basically flip, turn it around. You kept those tendons in like whole all the way down. Yeah, right off that shank. And then obviously you'll clean that up. You won't, I mean, I don't even grind those big old heavy tendons. No, pull no. Those out. <clears throat> so then that's what you end up with. But you've got the main muscles, you know, that's, that's your shank, you know, that, that'll go into grind. Um, that's that mock tender I was saying. You know, there's more trim. There's a lot of trim on that front shoulder, but it's good trim. And then you get your main muscle right there that can be. A do you nice do a roast. roast out of this this main muscle sometimes or? Typically. Okay. Yeah, and it's got a couple of different seams in it that you can kind of see here, and I'll take I'll even take that heavy ligament out just by separating that out. So if you were, you know, if you're at home processing this, and and you can do it after you cook the roast. I mean, it's not going to hurt it to cook it, but I like to clean it up and take it out. So once that is all cleaned up and all that's removed. You can run your knife along that ligament and just remove that ligament. So if I'm uh, if I'm in the field, get ready to put this in in the game bag. What uh, do you kind of seam it all together? Yeah. Um, and and so you don't have kind of pieces going everywhere, of course. Right. Okay. Yep. And then, like I said, if it depending on the temperature, you know, I mean, now that you're at that point, if you if you can cool that off for a bit, you know, that that'd be before ideal. you put it in the bag. Yeah. Before, yep. you, before you put it all in the bag. If it's hot and there's flies and you're just, it is what it is. So Jared, we're here with the uh, the hindquarter. You you were just saying that uh, that you would normally not do it on the block. It's easier to do it when it's hanging. Yeah. If I'm in the if I'm out in the in the backcountry, would you suggest 
paracord, hang it, and then cut that way? No. Okay. No, definitely not. Throw no. it down, t throw it on a tarp or a flat, yeah. flat clean surface and then start in this In way. Inevitably, it's going to hit the dirt. Yeah. If you do that. that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even take a chance on that. So just that's just mainly for further processing. Okay, perfect. So, all right, we're going to just kind of show how to break this down. And again, the idea here is, you know, keeping it clean. And this is, uh, Bridger did a good job on this one. Um, there's not a lot of hair. I, I've not seen. Little I might. I, I might have to get some lessons from Bridger on uh, meat preservation, because <laughs> there's not a darn thing that got got uh, uh, sacrificed in this animal. Yeah, I'm calling this the underside. Is this the side that you typically would start on for uh, for uh, deboning? To remove the bone, yeah. And okay. You can see it's right right there. You know, and you could do it. That on lower leg side, bone up it's, here it's to the right knee. Just right there. You've got a guide right there. You got a knee, you know, the other uh, joint right there that you can go to. Okay. So in this case, I am going to cut the hawk. I know it just pains you to do that, doesn't it? <laughs> so again, what we'll do here is we'll just we just want to take that bone out. That's all you want to do here, and the 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 key here is not just not to dig your knife in too much. You know, just follow the bone. Okay. Can you see that cut right there? You're right just up, following the outside right edge up, of the bone. Yep, right up you're not going the like along the top of it. You're you're allowing that yep, knife to go little, down a little bit. Yep, down a little bit. But see, we're not we're not into that next muscle. So, and like I said, you can kind of see from a contamination standpoint on a knife after you've skinned the animal, then you go in to do something like this. You can kind of see where that knife's been. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're just right around the keep your knife clean bone. is what you're clean. saying. Man, I, I mean, I used to carry a few wet wipes. It might be worth. Before I jump into this process, sure. yeah, rubbing a wet wipe, wet a wet wipe down that uh, knife blade wouldn't hurt. Because I, like I said, you can really tell once they've they've sat for a few you can. days. I, I, yeah, from the processing standpoint, you can see right where that knife's been. And yeah. a lot of times, this is where you know you get big gashes in the meat because you're going in too darn deep. Gotcha. Even though this is just going to be grind and. You know, we'll take that shank out and just follow it all the way up. So that bone has uh, kind of another little elongated part. Yep, a little bit of a notch. I mean, that's the ball joint on that hip. And then, you know, we've just followed that all the way along, just keeping the knife right along that bone. And then we're almost to the end of it there. <clears throat> so that's what you end up with is just a big chunk. And I, I tell you every year, I have a lot of customers that bring them in just like this. It's clean um, and the muscles are just, look exactly like that. You know, and then, I, and then it'd be further processed from there. If the bone was going to stay in, uh, now that the bone's out, this, this surface here, this surface here, that's all been handled, you are going to get a little bit of a crust forming on this where you typically wouldn't. So you're, you're going to lose some meat in here. Is that correct? Is that safe to say? Or <clears throat> and Each one, is, it just varies on how clean it is. Okay. You know, that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, from a processor standpoint, you know, that meat that is wrapped is going to be clean and, and ready to eat. So... If it looks contaminated, we'll clean it up. Yeah. Any last kind of uh, things that you would tell a hunter to think about as they're out in the field, um, getting ready to debone, or or anything that we've we've made, you know, tips or things that you think about as a processor that maybe I don't think about in the field, or that you you know think about as a hunter. Well, I think that really covers it. You know, having that little, being prepared, having that little sheet of plastic or. Uh, a uh, small tarp or something like that in the pack that doesn't weigh a lot, just to keep it clean. And then this is an opportunity to get it cooled off. You know, once that's spread open, you're going to feel that heat oh, yeah. come out of that. Big so, time. you know, and, and even if it's not as cool as you'd like out there, it still will will cool that off and uh, and then start that cooling off process where you can get it in that game bag and get it off the mountain. Perfect. Well, Jared, thanks a ton for your time today. I know Absolutely. it's uh, precious and we appreciate it. It's been super insightful and hopefully. For, for the guys watching, this, is, uh, this has been something that's, that's super valuable that, that they can take from, from here and from YouTube onto, uh, onto the field. Absolutely. Nothing more satisfying than, you know, number one, the hunt, and then the kill, and, and then the processing, and then enjoying, enjoying the harvest. Heck yeah. Thanks a ton. Yeah.